and welcome to another edition of Inside Sources with me, Gordon Mosley, our weekly podcast. And this week, my guest is Senior Counsel Ralph Ramkaran. He is the presidential candidate for a new and united Guyana, and of course, former Speaker of the National Assembly, and also a former executive member of the People's Progressive Party. Uh, thanks a lot, sir, for being here with us today. Thank you for having me. Um, so you decided to run for president? Well, I didn't decide. <laughs> it was decided for me. Tell us about that decision, though, when your party said to you, uh, Ralph, we want you to run for president. Did, did it take you long to think about it? Well, no, because uh, in our executive, comprising of 11 persons, the issue had been discussed from time to time, and my name was mentioned as a potential candidate. So it was, it was in the air. Uh, we had several discussions. And my name was not the only name discussed, unlike uh, some other parties mm -hmm. that where the presidential candidate and prime minister candidate was announced before the party was announced. <laughs> we had several discussions, several names were mentioned, and then we had a members meeting. Mm -hmm. And um, I was one of four nominees. So I, the other nominees uh, declined. Yeah. So uh, that was the process that we undertook. So I wasn't, uh, it wasn't that it was a surprise and uh -huh. I didn't take too long to consider it. So a new and united Guyana, it's a relatively new party. Uh, tell us about the formation of that party and why now? Well, what had happened is uh, sometime during last year, we were invited by a friend, um, a few of us, about half a dozen people or so. And the friend posed some questions for us, for everybody, including for himself. Um, is there a problem in Guyana? If there is, what is the problem? And how can it be resolved? So we decided there is a problem, a perennial problem of, uh, of, of our politics, of ethnic dominance in our politics. And that it can not be resolved by writing, by columns, by civil society, uh, by seminars and symposiums. It had to be resolved by a direct political engagement with the electorate. Mm -hmm. And the optimum conditions existed because there was a third party, the Alliance for Change, which had gone into coalition with the APNO, as we all know, and there was a coalition government in force. So there was space for a third party. There was always a third party in Guyana. Not all have been successful. Um, so there was space for a third party. And with the decline in influence of the AFC that we perceived, uh, we believe that uh, we can um, capture the momentum of a, a, par a but party. But do you think that is true, that the AFC has lost some of its power since joining the coalition? Well, the facts seem to suggest so because they got, uh, in, in 2006, they were able to get six seats. And remember when they, five seats, remember when they got those five seats, the PNC lost five seats. Uh -huh. So they took some seats away from the PNC. In 2011, they did a bit better. They, they got seven seats, I think, and the percentage went up to 10. Uh, they took some votes from the PVP because Remember, the PVP declined. Now, in the recent local government elections last year, true, it's not an elections that um, where the, the voting was very high, the percentage. But nevertheless, they got only 4% of the votes. But they so might that want seems to, to indicate that uh -huh. there is... Uh, they decline. might want to say those elections are very different, uh, that they did not contest in all areas and all of that. So how do you balance that with a national showing oh. at the national elections? Oh, quite, 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 quite. quite. The, the local government elections is not an accurate reflection of the true support of, but it can be, um, but our groundings and our going around the country, which we have been doing quietly, and our perception of what has been going on suggests that the AFC has lost some traction. So, Enog, uh, 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 your party, a new and united Guyana, uh, was it formed to take advantage of that perception? Or 
was it formed just after the no confidence vote thinking that by march we would have had elections and so you might have been able to play or take advantage of what was happening at that time no the essential reason that we were established was to promote a departure from ethno political dominance in our politics how that, do we do that? that well we have a plan mm -hmm. uh, which we, 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 uh, to bring together the two political parties in a in a constitutional structure and that is what we're fighting for not an agreement on arising after disputes and like the Hormonson Accord violence in the streets and so on we have a constitutional structure so that was that was the main reason because nobody was you see at, at that time during last year it was clear that the coalition would not uphold its manifesto promise of shared governance which was a prominent feature and they said that the, in 90 days or something they will start that process Th that process did not proceed so we saw the uh, if they had there would be no place for us so we saw that there was a space for us to propose a resolution to the main political problem in Guyana. The fact that the AFC we perceived had declined in support, we felt that it opened a space for us to... Uh, How has that been though? Since the formation of this party, do you think you have been pulling in enough support nationally that would give you a good showing as elections come March? There was no, there's no way of knowing that, unfortunately. But we have been going out, we've been going to markets, particularly where people are gathered. We've been going to various communities. We've been to Kwakwani, the PVP followed us, and then the PNC, the APNU followed us. Uh, I don't know what the PVP said at Kwakwani, but uh, uh, Minister Jordan, who was in Kwakwani, criticized the small parties, told people not to bother with these small parties. But the one in w on which he focused was uh, ourselves. He called us the nutmeg party, but that's okay. <laughs> Um, but he focused on us. So it seemed as if we were doing, we were making some kind of impact. But we went also to Aichuni. Things are very bad in Aichuni. And I'm very pleased to see that the government has issued some, um, some timber concessions there. Because things are really extremely bad. People mm -hmm. were in tears. We went to Linden several times. We went to Linden three times. We went to Borbis two times. We went to Escobar twice. We went... Um, to West Coast. So we're trying to expand. We're advertising extensively in the absence of the capacity to bring crowds in the street. So we are going around and we're getting, people are very polite and respectful. Some people are very worried about this situation, economic situation. There must be some area uh, you're going to be focusing on uh, that you might be seeing uh, this region or this area is where we can pull the most votes from. What are you seeing when you sit down and you look at the map and you try to figure out how you're going to get into parliament or win these elections? We're not seeing reasons. What we're seeing is groups. Okay. There's a large, there are, a, not large, there are a significant number of people on the edges of the PPP. Some workers, sugar workers in particular, business people and professional people who did not support the PPP the last time. And that was res that can't be denied. It was responsible for the PPP moving from 54% to 49%. Those people, from, from what we are hearing from people, those people are still not happy with the PPP. And they are going to, and we are hoping to gather that support. Second group is that there are a number we perceive of disgruntled AFC supporters. And in fact, many of the PUP supporters, former PUP supporters, who in fact uh, had voted for the PUP, had voted for the, for the coalition. So we see that as a source of support. And really and truly, we are hoping to target those groups of people. But without, at the same time, leaving out the broad mass of the Guyanese people, because when election season starts and people start coming out to meetings, we intend to go on the street corners. Do you think you can make it all the way, though? Well, we have, we believe we can. Um, it's difficult, very difficult, because you have to get 65 names 
30% women, you have to contest at least six constituencies with a minimum of 13% of seats, uh, and 20% of those people have to be women. Uh, 300 persons have to support your national list, and 150 persons each have to support each constituency list. So it's a big job. It's a big job. It's a big job. And difficult. Uh, very difficult. But we think we can do it. And we are talking to the smaller parties in which we are in contact, with which we are in contact, uh, about three or four of them, and proposing that, look, whichever one of us cannot meet the starting line, we should offer our support and our names and our lists and whatever material we have to the party which is going to reach the starting line. So we hope to cooperate with the um, existing small parties. Well, you have like about um, three or four of them, three others. You have the Federal Party, you have Change Guyana, you have Citizenship Initiative. Mm -hmm. At least those three that have been prominent in their launchings and stuff like There's that. There's a new party going to come out. I'm, uh -huh. I'm not permitted Another one? To, to, I'm not permitted to <laughs> reveal the, um, the, the particulars, but there's a, there's a party of young people, uh -huh. prominent young professionals. So but do you think they, they, they will really make sense? Well, I don't know. You, you know These small pri parties, because prior they're, they're starting up uh, months before an election. Prior to the constituency system mm. being, in, being uh, provided for by law, I think this is for the, from, nine, from 2006 onwards. At every election, part, actually eight, nine parties used to contest. Yeah. Uh, for example, my friend Safir Hussein, I remember him because I saw him yesterday. Safir Hussein Subidar, the lawyer in practice. He has a political party, National Independence Party. The tiger roars, the tiger is his, uh, is his um, symbol. He hasn't been able to contest in elections. So, but under the old system, the system prior to 2006, he would have been there. All you have to get was the 65 names, and that's not too difficult. So it has become more difficult for smaller it parties? It has now then? become more difficult because of the constituency, um, because you have to contest a minimum of six constituencies. I know you said that one of the things you've been saying to the small parties is, in case they don't see themselves making it, they give the support over to whichever small party may be in front. Yeah. Why not come together as a small party group and say, Let's pull all the resources together and go in as a coalition of small parties. Have you been trying that? Ideally, that is so. We have spoken to all the small parties except Change Guyana. Uh -huh. um, one of the problems is the presidential candidacy. Now, I would like to say and say publicly that if one of the parties can provide a presidential candidate that we believe covers all the points that we wish to see in a presidential candidate, I will withdraw. There is no problem for that. But we don't see anybody at the moment that, um, who satisfies those conditions. Not even Badal? Well, we have to talk to Mr. Badal to see what his what his uh but surely you must know his record i know mr badal i know his record he's a good think record he's presidential material he's a good record he is presidential material but you know mr badal said that he will national um privatize electricity we have some problems with his, the programs as announced mm. he said he will privatize electricity well electricity was privatized before and the people, the people who bought the electricity company sold it back to the government for a dollar. So that was tried. Uh, do we have any, any, any innovative system for our electricity to provide cheap, clean electricity for Guyana? There was a proposal before, during the PVP regime, uh, for the Amila Falls, but because of the cost of that, because it was done in secrecy mm. because 
of political in antagonism and for a variety of reasons, one being the failure of the Skeldon project, all of those combined uh, kill that system, kill, kill Amila. We need to go back to um, hydroelectricity with a different approach, a national approach, an inclusive approach, so that everybody is there from the beginning, and, and particularly a political approach. So we have serious problems with, um, with Mr. Badal's program. Now, people go in and talk things about reducing VAT and all of these things. Now, those things are very nice to say to the public, you know, but reducing income tax, reducing, I don't mean re reducing income tax for the smaller persons, the low earners, yeah. which, is, which is something that we would support. But for the wealthy who are going to reduce income tax, no matter what they say, it's eventually going to reach for the wealthy. I pay 40%, I'm at the top of the scale. Mm -hmm. And we have no intention of interfering with that unless something dramatically changes in the end. Reducing the price of cars, only rich people, not rich, but <laughs> you know, a you certain think level are, of people who you own. You think those are promises economy. that cannot be met? Well, not that they cannot be met, but we have serious problems of poverty in Guyana. Thirty, the last figures, the old figures, but the last figures show that thirty percent of the Guyanese people live in poverty, and that's about two hundred, two hundred thousand people, and thirty percent of those live in extreme poverty. Mm -hmm. That's another seventy-five thousand to a hundred thousand people. Do, do, look at our health system. Look at our school system. One child was saw it in the paper. It was hospitalized beaten by bullies, this eight-year-old child. So we have very serious problems in our social services that have to be met before we talk about reducing prices for motor vehicles. Tell me about some of the uh, programs and the initiatives that uh, your party and you and United Guyana will focus on as you get into campaign season. Uh, what are the top five that you're looking at that you think uh, will connect more to the people you want to give you their support? We believe our, 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 our um, main program, our vision, our uh, presentation to the Guyanese electorate is to change the governance system. We believe that everything falls on that. People have made the manifesto promises that are made by both of the major parties. They are generally similar. Yeah. They're not fulfilled, certainly not all. And they're not fulfilled because of lack of funds. So what we need to do is to provide a governance system in which both political parties share equally in the government. And that will solve the problems of Econ economic problem, not solve, but help to relieve the economic problem. It will help to relieve the dissension in the society. Yeah. It will end the struggle for ethnic dominance. And we are proposing to the people of Guyana that you support us. Now, we would like to win a majority, and those of us who um, are, have overconfidence expect us to win the elections, but realistically, if we were to get people to give us enough support to keep the two main parties below an absolute majority, we will, whichever one gets the plurality, we will then be in a position to ensure, in return for our support, that they proceed with constitutional reform to change the structure of the government to one in which both political parties share equally in the government. Equally because we perceive that Indians don't, generally speaking, don't want to be ruled by Africans. And Africans don't want to be ruled by Indians. So, equality. Now, whichever party wins the majority will have to Address that. Make, make a compromise. But in 1978, Cherry Jagan proposed 
that the party that wins the majority will accept only the prime ministership and the party that wins and that party will not contest a seat a, a, the position of the presidency so he was proposing that the second party the party that brings second takes the presidency you obviously can see where that w was leading now the PVP proposed that so it's not beyond the realm of possibility that we can get the majority party to share equally the parliament will be representative of the, of, of the voting system but the executive will be out of parliament so, so once constitutional once reform is your big it, issue is our big issue but when you talk about constitutional reform it's 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 so trite now that people dismiss you that's what, what I mean what you mean by constitution? That's what I'm getting at because you so talk to the ordinary we, man. That's we that's why we talk about a governance system. Okay. We want a governance system that satisfies the need of everybody. Now we are telling Indian Guyanese that if you support us, you're not wasting your vote because if your if in a contest between the two parties the PVP loses, you lose. Turn the African voter that if you support us, the same thing. Be, if either, if both of you support us, both of you gain because we are putting your parties in government. But don't you You're think? Losing. But don't you think that the political parties, the one that's in government now, and uh, the PPP have made efforts to sort of bridge that divide, and uh, they've made efforts over the years to balance it off, uh, ensure that Afro-Guyanese communities and Indo-Guyanese communities benefit from the resources of government, benefit from the programs of government. So when you say something like that, how do you think that will come across? Well, I, 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 the both will benefit because both will have a, the, both parties will be equally uh, in government, will have programs that will benefit both societies, that will, have, will benefit both, both societies and both sections of our population will feel confident that their representatives look it's okay as Henry Jeffrey said in, in the newspaper in his article recently 95% mm. of Af uh, African Americans voted for Obama nobody saw that strange so why should 95% of Africans supporting up nor 95% of Indians supporting the PPP be strange in Guyana that's a reality of life we have to face but in Guyana, with the two large ethnic groups, the insecurity is there. No matter what you do or do not do, a, a PVP government, no matter what it does or does not do for the African people of Guyana, they will still not be comfortable with a PVP government. Why not? And vice versa. Why do you think that That's is? That's the reality of life in Guyana. But why? We had some degree of economic development between 2006, 2011. Uh, the economy slowed up in the years prior to that. We had um, things picked up by about 2006, 2005, 2006. We had great housing program. All everybody benefited across the board you can make criticisms here and there but generally across the board benefit employment increased um, there were some negatives people were very angry at the fat and so on but you and when Jagde went about when president Jagde went about in African communities he was mobbed that gave the PPP a belief that they would win 60 percent of the vote in 2011 so where did they go wrong? They didn't go wrong anywhere. They didn't go wrong. Africans are not going to support the PPP, broadly speaking. And Indians are not going to support the PNC, but again, broadly speaking. To my question. That's not going to happen. Why? Because we're an ethnic society with ethnic insecurities. And to resolve those in insecurities, we are in a constant struggle for ethnic dominance. The only way we can get ethnic dominance is through our politics. Can't get it any, anywhere else. Any other. Indians are in business, some, a few, a tiny few doing well. Africans are in administration, a tiny few doing well. But each feel insecure in their place. But and how they do you want a party that will ensure their security. But how do you do that um, when, as a new party, you're saying this is the reality and um, you're not talking. Uh, 
generally about what we have heard other parties say we're going to bring together the people uh, you seem to be saying this is the reality you've got to find a way to maneuver well, through the reality well how successful have they been in bringing together the people i'm talking about a situation that has existed that manifested itself in 1957 now how many years is that 50 60 years it manifested itself and not it was not unknown before that when the ppp was established in 1950 the ppp had Ashton Chase as its chair, chairman. Cherry Jagan was the leader. And Billy Strachan from the United Kingdom wrote to Cherry and said, look, hold on with Chase. There's a young, bright guy here who is going home soon. His name is Forbes Barnum. Uh, he's a lawyer, he's a professional. Ashton was not a professional at that time. There is a professional man, he's good, he's left wing and so on that was a big qualification in those days and wait until you talk to him when Barnum came Ashton agreed to step aside now from 1950 and this would have been long before the leaders of the PPP the people who wanted to form the PPP were aware of the fact that you have to bridge this ethnic divide so it was in existence long before then it broke up in 55 it manifested itself in the 1957 elections. It has been there. All the goodwill, there are many people of goodwill in the society. All the goodwill, all the efforts of bringing people together have failed. Not because people are bad, not because people are wicked, but because that's the nature of ethnic politics. And when we return, we'll continue our conversation with Mr. Ralph Ramkaran, Senior Counsel. He is the presidential candidate for a new and united Guyana. This is Inside Sources. The Ethnic Relations Commission, ERC, wishes to inform that it continues to monitor the outputs of the Guyanese media and comments posted on social media outlets. The Commission would like to discourage persons and institutions from heightening tensions through incitement and from indulging in advocating or promoting discrimination or discriminatory practices on the ground of ethnicity. All are reminded that Section 139D1 of the Representation of the People's Act states that any person who makes or publishes or causes to be made or published any statement or takes any action which results or can result in racial or ethnic violence or hatred among the people shall be liable on conviction on indictment to a fine of $100,000 together with the imprisonment for two years. The Commission urges all to be familiarized with this law and to be responsible in their related endeavors. A message from the ERC, working to build a united Guyana through the promotion of harmony and good relations. We are legions of men standing strong, but never too proud to stoop and help someone. We must send a clear signal to all. Do right. Walk in upright ways, knowing that's what being a man is all about. And ever aware that things will only get worse when good men do nothing. Stand strong. Be the one to live right. Tired of long lines? Register with MyGTT at MyGTT.co.gy. That's MyGTT.co.gy to view and pay your bills from anywhere. Enter to win an Amazon gift card worth 25 US dollars or a bounty voucher worth 5,000 Guyana dollars when you sign up today. GTT, do more. And in case you're now joining us, this is Inside Sources. I'm Gordon Mosley, and my guest this week is Ralph Ramkaran, the senior counsel. Of course, you know he's a former speaker of the National Assembly, a former executive member of the People's Progressive Party, was there for a number of years, but now he's heading into the next elections as the presidential candidate for a new party, and it's called A New and United Guyana. Uh, so we were looking at some of the things you'll be campaigning on. Uh, we started looking at constitutional reform and the constitution what are some of the other issues we have the oil and gas sector that is uh, gonna pick up next year uh, we have the issues of jobs we have climate change what are some of the other issues you're going to be focusing on our biggest issues are in relation to the improvement in our social services we want as, as a result of our oil income as it comes it's, it will be small at first but we would like to concentrate first 
on alleviating the problems of poverty in the society. Now, there would be simultaneous problems. There will mm. be problems that will be facing us simultaneously in the oil and gas industry, in electricity, in, um, in, 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 in local content, and, and so on. But I think the most urgent problem for Guyanese is to resolve our own problems of poverty and unemployment. How do you do that, though? Well, we, as, 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 as inflows come in, we will, we will put more emphasis on alleviating the problems of poverty. Now, this government has in, improved, increased taxes in a lot of areas, have collected more funds, uh, the inland revenue, the GRA, the boasting quite often about the increase in the amounts they're collecting, but we're not seeing it. What we are seeing, in fact, is the incapacity to spend. Now, we don't know what's the reason for that. Certainly one is the shortage of skills. Uh, certainly one is lack of competence. So we need to get that problem resolved. So the benefits of the income we have, and as a result of not being spending, that is what is causing some of the problems of unemployment, people yeah. complaining that things are getting bad. Because money is not being spent, money is not being generated, and uh, employment is not being sustained. So we need to resolve those kinds of problems very, very early. Uh, we need to watch also at the um, there are 7,000 sugar workers who have been um, <coughs> retrenched. We need to look at how we're going to resolve those problems. Those communities are dying. We have we've been to Linden three times. I mentioned to you before we came on the year, Aichuni, um, where things are very very bad. Um, so those deprived communities we need to look at to see how we can generate employment, generate social services to ensure that poverty does not increase. You spent several <coughs> years in the uh, People's Progressive Party, sir. Why did you leave? I left because I wrote an article. I used to write for the Mirror uh -huh. uh, one, every week. And I wrote an article saying that, I thought it was a very moderate article, saying that, look, this government came to power at a time when the, um, when the expenditure for infrastructure was three billion Guyan dollars. And even then there was corruption, the allegations of corruption. After the 2012 was the year, at, by 2012 the expenditure for infrastructure was 20 billion dollars. Now all the government did was to reform the audit department to ensure auditing was up to date. But it has not done anything more than that to improve corruption. And people were complaining bitterly about corruption in the um, procurement industry. This is a 2012 this, article. This is 2012. So the government needs to look at that and mm -hmm. take further steps to avoid, to solve the problem of pervasive corruption. Now, President Ram 2012 Ramatar was president. So I met him at, um, at a function. I happened to accidentally meet him at a function. It wasn't planned. And I told him, took the opportunity to tell him that I had written this article and I explained it to him as I explained it to you now. He said, that's okay. But, <laughs> A week or two after that, I came in for heavy blows by some members of the executive with Donald Ramatar presiding over the meeting. And I was accused of, of, of attacking the government and, you know, as, 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 as a person of, as a member of the executive, I should bring these problems to executive. But the executive of the PPP, and people accuse me of talking about corruption now and not talking about it before. but. The issue of corruption had been raised repeatedly in the executive. People like Komal Chand and others who also have been kicked out quietly out of the executive. Komal Chand, several other people, have raised the question of corruption repeatedly. But 
nothing was being done about it. Do you think it. it was widespread corruption under the PP civic government? We, there was a, a lot of corruption in the procurement system, yes. It can be proved. The, the, the question is prove it. But we know because people tell us. People tell us, public servants tell us, the people who are corrupt tell us, but it can be repeated. So we know that there was corruption. But um, I, I don't know about the use of the word widespread, but okay. there was a lot of corruption. Um, it, it was, the corruption was being spoken about not only in the, among PUP circles, the corruption was being spoken about by members of the public, especially mm -hmm. members of the public, people who, who knew. Yeah. People in the know, so to speak. So it was time to look at something, um, and I did a very modest article, but I was severely attacked. And, I, um, and that was your undoing? It, that was my undoing. The, the attack was hard. Criticism is okay. I'm not the first time I was criticized or anybody else. That's a uh, uh, regular thing. You couldn't criticize Mr. Jack Dew, of course. Um, <laughs> but um, criticism is okay. But some very horrible things were said, very nasty, unpleasant things. And I, I called for an apology, and it wasn't forthcoming. And Donald Ramatar did not defend me. And these things were said at the executive at level? At the executive meeting. And Donald Ramatar did not defend me. So I left. But persons within the PPP have also said that your reason for leaving is because when they were going to choose a presidential candidate uh, leading up to the 2011 elections, you wanted to be that candidate and they well, chose Mr. Ramatar. I campaigned publicly. I mean, uh, that was no secret. So was so that your beef? No, no, no. That was not my beef. Pre Ram Donald Ramatar and I had a meeting on the last day of parliament in May 2011 came into me as the day Parliament closed off. He came into me, I was, of course, my last day as Speaker. We had a long, extensive talk. Mm -hmm. um, I explained to him that I would be unable to campaign in the elections, but he has my support. Um, I said, I'm wounded. I think that's the word I used. I said, I'm wounded. So I need some time to heal. He said, okay, no, no problem. Why do you think they went for Ramatar over you? Uh, you have to ask that of Mr. Jack Dale. You I, think it was I, his I, doing? I, I do, yes, it is his doing. It is Mr. Jack Dale's doing. He was the person who um, chose Ramatar and everybody followed him. Was it a bad choice? Um, <laughs> Donald is my friend, so... <laughs> so but let me, put, let me tell you this. Let me answer you this way. About a year before the choice was made, I went to Borbis High Court and I took the opportunity of meeting Zulfikar Mustafa and his deputy. Uh, I invited them out to lunch. They said, no, we're inviting you out to lunch. And they took me to State House, which was good because the opportunity of confidentiality was greater there. We had lunch there. Present was Zulfikar Mustafa and um, I can't remember the young man's name now, but and Zulfikar was, was regional chairman, his deputy. So I told them about, you know, I want your support and so on, the usual spiel. They said, look, if there is a secret ballot, they would support me. Um, so I said, what do you think about if Donald is the candidate? They said that if Donald is the candidate, they are not going to bring out the people to vote for him. Said if I'm the candidate, what? They said if I'm the candidate, they'll be able to bring. So out they preferred the you. Know. That's what they said. But they couldn't do it. They couldn't do it with the ballot on a show of hands. But by the time, by the time the the selection process came around, um, all those fellows, things had gone. Uh, the way in which Jack Dale wanted. Most of the people had um, had decided to support Ramatar. So, what do you think he held over them that would make them switch? Like any president holds over people, like Trump holds over the Republican Party now. It's always the, it's always the situation. Influence? Yes, influence your president and people. 
see that as uh, something that uh, they can't resist. Do you like think the Republicans are doing with Trump at the moment? Do you think he would have made a better president than Ramatar? Well, I would have done things differently. I don't know if it would have made a, I would have made a better president. Such as you know when Desmond Hoyt in 1997, it was reported to me by somebody who was supposed to know. I can't remember who it was now, but I knew then. I recall then that it was somebody who was supposed to have known that Hoyt said that if Ram Karan was the choice, there would have been no problem in 1997. In 2011, if I had been chosen, my first engagement would have been to deal with relations with the opposition. Look, my political career had been, my public political career in public affairs, had been as a member of the Elections Commission, as, a me as the chairman of the Constitutional Reform Commission, and a speaker. In each of those positions, the opposition was on the other side. I was sitting in each of those positions with the opposition on the other side. This was not a private PVP. These were not private PVP affairs. So I have, I have had all these experiences of working with the opposition and resolving differences. And that would have been my first job. Again, the PPP, your former party, is getting ready for these elections. They have chosen a presidential candidate. Mr. Jagdio, again, very influential in that decision. Uh, your thoughts about Irfan Ali as a presidential candidate, as someone you'll be up against? Well, the best thing I can say for Irfan is I wish him well. <laughs> it's a big job. For a big man, whether he can uh, fill the, if he wins, whether he can fill the shoes of a president, we have to see. But if Irfan does not deal with the, if they win the elections, and he does not deal with the political problem, he does not deal with the problem of ethnic dominance in our society. He does not does not deal with the fact that. Most Africans are going to support APNU and AFC. If he's not going to deal with the fact that they will feel as if the PPP is going to deprive them of something, if he doesn't deal with those facts, he's not going to succeed. And oil wealth is not going to make him succeed. You don't think so? I don't think so. It, the oil wealth will alleviate the tension down the road when the oil money becomes significant. It will help to alleviate the tension in the society, but it won't solve the problem. Do you think he's ready, though? Well, I don't think he's ready, but he can become ready on the job. Remember, there is no school that teaches you how to become president. There is no, uh, there is no training ground, so to speak. So um, he will have to learn on the job. Still in his 30s. Do you think Mr. Jagdeo's influence on the party uh, is a good thing going into these elections? Well, I don't know that it's... Uh, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing. He has a very strong influence on the party. He has been doing some things good. He's been, some people have been critical of him. Um, unlike when I was there, there is a section of the executive that is critical... That, that Not critical. There is a section of the executive that is not fully ad item mm -hmm. with um, Mr. Jack Leo. Um, when I was there, the, that section did not exist. So uh, I, I suppose that he is reflecting or he's exercising authority and developing his ideas on the basis that, look, I have to accommodate other views, which is a good thing. Mr. Jack Dave in his younger days was very intolerant of opposition and criticism and all of that. But, you know, people, many leaders choose people who disagree with them so that they can have a, a, a opposite opinions. And I hope Mr. Jack Dave has learned that, that it's a good thing to have people who disagree with you, not a bad thing. And sir, on the other side, the APNU AFC, uh, Mr. Granger seeking re-election. What do you think are his chances? 
is the difficult. The APNU, APNU itself, PNC in its earlier days, the highest votes they have ever received is 42%. Now, and they probably, if, if they were fighting alone in, in, in 2015, with the effort APNU put out in 2015, they probably would have got the 42 percent because I mean they took people in bed, uh, people who were ill in bed who would not normally have voted, and, mm -hmm. and, and they, they took them to the to the polling booths. They really made a big effort in 2015 to bring out people. So, but the highest they have got is 42 percent. It was AFC which took them over the over the 50 percent. If AFC has faltered, as I believe it has substantially faltered. They're not going to make it to the 51%, assuming free and fair elections. So he has a difficult struggle. David Granger has a difficult struggle. He's a very much liked politician among his supporters. He's a nice man. I've known him for a very long time. Not, not well, but I've known him uh, since long before 2015. We worked together in the, um, the constitutional reform border okay. and and security command. He doesn't mention my name. He said he was the chairman, <laughs> but he was the co-chair. <laughs> and the report has both our names. So um, he doesn't mention me, but that's okay. So we worked together, actually, prior to, um, prior to, and that was since 2001. If you get a call from one of those two major parties saying, Uncle Ralph, come on this side, and we will guarantee you this, which one would you be more inclined to listen to? I won't be inclined to listen to any, uh, anything. One, I don't want any, any government position. One, I'm mm -hmm. getting on in years. Um, I've been there. But you're running for that. president. Uh, well, I'm running for president because, um, <laughs> because um, <laughs> I'm, I'm the best figure. I'm, I don't expect to be president, but uh, hopefully uh, we can do something to get some seats in the National Assembly. But again, back to the question. Well, no, I'm, I'm not going to accept If there's a anything. green phone and there's a red phone, I'm not going <laughs> they're to ringing. I'm not going to accept any invitation. I don't want to get involved in partisan politics. the party, politics. though. I don't want to get involved in partisan politics because I don't believe either political party is interested in doing the things that I want to do, which is to say, change the system of governance. You prefer to speak to the smaller parties? I prefer to speak to the small parties. We have met all the smaller parties on several occasions. Um, except for Change Guyana. All the others we have met. And the, the ones that are likely to come on stream we have met already. So going into the elections, do you see a pact with the smaller parties? I hope so. I hope there can be a pact. I hope so. I strongly hope so. Do you think the elections will be free and fair? Very few people who I speak to think that the elections will be free and fair. What do you think? <laughs> I'm hoping the elections will be free and fair. It's not easy to rig elections uh, in the circumstances here. Uh, there is there's the possibility of some skullduggery, but I don't think the type of skullduggery that is possible can significantly in influence the vote. Having said that, the, the margin is small, but I don't think the skullduggery will, 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 that is likely to take place will affect do you think GCOM has been doing enough to allay your fears? I think, I don't think, uh, I, I, I think GCOM is generally on the right track. I'd like to see more, less dissension. But GCOM is in the right track. You know, we went, we met GCOM. And, you know, all we heard is what the PPP did in the past. The, especially from the more vocal members of the, of the, decide representing nominated by the government um, we heard what the and all of these complaints are about minuscule um, discrepancies minuscule things that have no significant rel significant impact on elections so the suspicion is great but the real and, and, and the chairman is, was hesitant, has been hesitant, but I think the hesitancy, she, she, the hesitancy is one because she was new, mm -hmm. and the hesitancy also is because she's facing a very, very divided commission, a very difficult position, difficult situation, 
And we wish her the best. She's, she's done the right thing so far. Hopefully she will continue to do so. So in wrapping up, sir, if you have, have an opportunity right now to speak to the voters, especially those first time voters, what do you say to them to bring them over on your side? If you want your party to win, vote for us. That sounds contradictory. But our program is to bring the two main parties together and keep them in government. So when you vote for us, your party goes in government. You think that will be enough? Will that not be enough? We will ensure that the oil wealth, which is on everybody's minds, is used for the benefit of the people of Guyana. We will end the corruption or do our best to end it. And we will make laws, we will provide for laws, we will strengthen the um, integrity commission. We'll provide for new laws to bring down corruption. And we'll engage the people of Guyana on the crime situation because the biggest, the biggest weapon against crime is the people. And when the PPP is in power, African people don't assist in crime prevention. When APNO is in power, Indian people don't assist in crime prevention. You need people on the ground to keep an eye out, not in their communities and out of their communities. And that's the biggest weapon. So we believe that if we have both sides together working, that will significantly reduce crime. So we have a governance system, corruption, crime, and poverty. Those are our targets. You think that'll be enough to get these elections? I think so. All right, Mr. Ralph Ramkaran, thank you for spending your afternoon with us. Uh, we thank you for coming here and talking with Inside Sources. My name is Gordon Mosley, encouraging you to once again tune into this program right here on the YouTube, Facebook, and HJ94.1, and of course, HJ Channel 72. Have a good afternoon.